Well, it seems like things are changing a little bit, seeing some familiar faces, some new faces, and that is a really, really good thing. Uh, well, again, welcome on behalf of our church family. It really is good to spend time with you guys this morning. Um, we only have just a couple announcements to keep, uh, keep you informed of stuff that's going on. As you know, we're in the Christmas season, amen? And it's a great time to uh, be looking up and celebrating the birth of Jesus, but also being anticipatory of his return as well. Amen? So this coming Wednesday, December 23rd, we are going to have a Christmas Eve Eve candle lighting service at 6 p.m. And this service is going to be a little bit unique because our junior high and senior high will be having a special service for them. So if you know any junior hires or senior hires that uh, could use some joy and hope in the presence of Jesus, invite them, bring them as uh, our youth director, Daniel. He's got an amazing time prepared for them, and we're going to have a great time as well. The next day, Thursday, actual Christmas Eve, the 24th, we will be having two services. Our first service will be at 5.30 p.m., and then we'll be following it with a service at 7 p.m. Now, the services on both Wednesday and Thursday, the very first service, we'll be having children's ministry, children's church. So if you've got kiddos, uh, infant through kindergarten, Miss Patricia Shirley has an amazing time scheduled for them. Otherwise, it'll be a family-friendly service where you can bring uh, your kiddos and we'll be doing candle lighting with them as well. Uh, we will not be having children's service at the 7.30 on Thursday, or 7 o'clock, sorry. But other than that, it's going to be an amazing time. Amen? How many of you guys heard or participated in our PJ and Coat Drive? You guys remember? We partnered with a couple different places uh, throughout Thurston County to provide winter coats and PJs for kids in foster care right here in Thurston County. And I just wanted to give you an update because it's so good when you partner with people in kingdom business and you go further faster together. So this year, amidst everything that was going on, we still managed to collect almost 300 coats and PJs to give out. And, and wait, that's not it. There was also uh, almost $1,700 raised in addition 
to what was purchased so that we could buy even more. So put your hands together because that's the work that you guys are doing. I was so proud, so proud to know that even in difficult times, the church is still the church, still doing the stuff, still being the hands and feet of Jesus. And it looks really good on you. So, sorry, I'm getting all emotional. Anyway, I'm gonna pray for tithes and offerings and then we'll continue in our church service. The, uh, the, the tithe bags will not be passed around, but there will be somebody at the end of service. So if you came prepared today, you can drop them off there, but we're gonna pray ahead of time for it. Amen? So would you pray with me? Father God, we're so thankful again for your provision in our lives, in all places and in all spaces. God, would you receive today what is given? tithes, offerings, and would you multiply them and use them, continue to reach out into our communities, put food in bellies and clothes on, on people and, and roofs over people's heads, and God, would you, oh, would you just do, do more than we could ever expect you to do, and, and you're the God of miracles, so we can't even fathom the things that you can do, and yet that's, that's who you are. And it's what you do. So thank you for inviting us in to participate with you, to contribute to your mission, and to be partakers of the kingdom of God that is everywhere we go because you are with us. So we praise you. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. And if you agree, would you say amen? Amen. Well, I'm going to keep this short and sweet. Junior hires, you guys, junior high, senior high, you guys are released for your service. We love you. It's going to be a good time for you guys today. And uh, keep those applauses going because my beautiful wife, Miss Sarah, is going to be bringing the word today. So would you help me invite her to the stage? I told him last night, probably the last words out of my mouth before I closed my eyes were, don't make me cry before I get on the stage. Um, well, over the last few weeks, um, we have been introduced to the who that God is for us. Um, during this Christmas season, I do truly believe that God is reminding us of the who that he is so that we can be the us that he's created. So I know that this is the third installment in the Christmas message. Um, if you've missed any of those messages, um, you're in luck because our wonderful tech team has been able to put those onto YouTube. So you can go to our YouTube channel, you can subscribe, you can view any of our messages, let alone the last two. So Pastor Georgie covered a wonderful counselor. Then Pastor Mike my husband, covered Mighty God. And today, we're going to be tackling together Everlasting Father. So before we get into the scripture, there is a little bit of backstory into the book of Isaiah that I wanted to go over. Now in the first 12 chapters, it has Isaiah talking to the people of Israel. He's addressing those that were not following God. He, he was attempting to show the people what God's true plan was for their lives. Now, Isaiah, he, he describes a new king and how that new king would come to give freedom from oppression. The prophecy describes the coming king to be named Emmanuel, God with us. Now, the king was described as being empowered by God's spirit. We know this. We know this. A savior was promised to be sent to save the world. Then a mere, it sounds funny, but a mere 400 years later, from the time it was prophesied in the Old Testament to when that baby comes. 400 years. Now let's, let's read that promise. If I can get this to work. 
it's a running joke in our friend circle that I am the least technological person in the whole group. There we go. <laughs> so um, we're going to read from the book of Isaiah, the same passage that we've been reading through the last couple weeks. So um, Isaiah 9, and the scriptures will be on the screen behind me. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David, and over his kingdom to establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal, the excitement of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now, there is a goal for today, and it's to gain even a little bit more understanding of the promise that Isaiah spoke over Israel about the coming king and how we can let that prophecy affect our lives and how we can use that knowledge to become closer in relationship to our Heavenly Father. There is the best part about this promise is we already know that that prophecy has come true. Jesus did come and he did fulfill all of those promises. And he's still fulfilling those today. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come and gather together and learn more about what you say about us and how we are to think about you. We thank you for opening our eyes and opening our ears and opening our hearts to what you'd like us to receive today. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, my first point for this morning, it's pretty easy if you're taking notes. It's just everlasting. We're talking about the everlasting father, right? So what do you think when you hear the word everlasting? Honestly, the first thing that I thought of was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. (laughs) So Charlie and his grandpa are getting a tour. Everybody's in this place with me, right? He's getting a tour through the factory. Goes from room to room, and every little kid is getting in trouble and doing something that they're not supposed to be doing. And they get to the one room where Willy Wonka is showing them his best invention yet, the everlasting gobstopper. He says, this is the most, I had to watch the movie, this is the most secret machine in the entire factory. Passes one out to each little kid, and he says, they never get smaller. He then makes them promise to never give the candy away to anyone. Now, I don't know if you can see what I'm getting at, but God has made it so that we only need to know what we need to know at specific times, for specific reasons. We'll never fully know or understand those things until we're in heaven. But he does give us glimpses into what heaven can look like. We have a God who's everlasting. He never gets smaller, and he never goes away. We get to keep God for ourselves so that we have our own relationship with him. But this is where God is better than candy. (laughs) Because we get to share him with whoever we want. Now, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie or read the book, 
Charlie gives Willy Wonka back the everlasting gobstopper at the end of the movie. And he is greatly rewarded for his faithfulness and willingness to keep a promise. And God wants to greatly reward you for your efforts and for your faithfulness. Now, something being everlasting is knowing that it'll never go away. It's something eternal. The way that everlasting is used in scripture is used to describe someone as a person who knows everything from beginning to end. Now, God knows your life as a whole, not by individual minutes. It's like I said in the beginning of the message, it was 400 years from the prophecy to the baby. Now, I can somewhat relate to this, and as I move forward, I think you're going to get what I'm, what I'm letting, you, letting you in on, so hear me please. We hear so often that God is returning, that I want God to come back yesterday. We're caught in this place of believing in faith for when God is to come, to be prepared for his return but we've been waiting, yet we still have the faith that it will happen. The Israelites had the faith that God would come through a sent savior. They didn't know that he would come as a baby. When we read wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince, of peace. The government will be on his shoulders. He will uphold it with justice and righteousness. How could anyone have contemplated that God would send Jesus as a baby? So when we read some other scriptures with a new sense of God's timelessness, let us use this perspective. God is living in a moment where in time for us, but a blink of an eye for him. Because he is eternal and he is outside of time. So Hebrews 13, 8, one we all know, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I also wanted to read 1 Peter, verse 1 starting in three through nine. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed In the last time. In this you rejoice, though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes through, excuse me, more precious than gold that perishes through it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith for the salvation of your souls. Now I can say that I was super excited to preach today. I was beyond thrilled to be able to be in front of you to share God's message. However, I've been fighting a little bit of spiritual warfare 
throughout the week in preparing this message. Typically, I find that that happens for me when the enemy doesn't want the people to hear what the Father wants to say. So many people are okay with the idea of Jesus being our wonderful counselor. Knowing that there is someone to turn to for help. Someone in your corner to back you up. Most of us love the thought of God having the power. Much like our love for superheroes, we think of God being mighty. We tend to, we tend to think of all the things he could do. And then we have everlasting Father. Father. For some, I understand that this title that God gives, that that God has promised to Jesus, can sometimes evoke some unmet expectations and maybe some negative feelings. No, I believe that the reason we hear, when we hear the word Father, we tend to think of our, the closest example that we have, our own earthly dads. Now, this relationship can influence the way we see our Heavenly Father. We tend to put our own experiences of our own fathers on what we tend to believe about God and how he's going to treat us. I don't know, was your dad a jerk? Was he a disciplinarian, a perfectionist? Was he hypercritical, angry, absent? There are so many instances that I can think of where the enemy has come in and used my earthly father's shortcomings to make me agree to things that God didn't ever plan for me. They've distorted my view of the fatherly figure of God. Now let's be clear, in case he's watching, I have a great dad, I love you. (laughs) He's always been very supportive, loving, and trustworthy. But let's be even more clear. That's my dad that God gave me for earth. I have a daddy in heaven too. And his character is undeniable. And he does take care of his kids. So I had a slide prepared, just a few characteristics of God. So one, he provides strength of everlasting arms. He ministers with everlasting consolation. He performs his work with everlasting power. He rules over an everlasting kingdom. He maintains an eternal presence. He gives us life that is eternal. And he graciously provides for those who realize that eternal values are what really count. So when the Bible talks about God being the Father, it talks about his being the creator of all things, the originator, because it starts with him. Do you know who Walter Camp is? We might have some sports buffs in the house. His claim to fame? Well, he's the father of football. I thought it was Sunday. It was a good time to talk about him. (laughs) Taking the sport of rugby as it stood and turning it into how we see American football today. The father of football, the creator, and the originator. Do you know that our fourth president, James Madison, is created to be the father of the Constitution? We might have known that one from history class. These people were the originators and the creators of these historic events, so they receive the label 
Father of. God is the Father of creation. He's above all time. He is the everlasting Father. Now, there is another with the label Father that I wanted to address today. He's not credited as being very popular or very good either. He's the father of lies. He is the originator of lies, the one who makes them up. One of the most popular examples of this is Eve in the Garden of Eden. She chose to believe the father of lies. She ate the fruit. She thought that it was good enough to share. So she gives it to Adam, and he eats of it as well. This is the first time that we, that we see that something has to die so that something can be covered by God. They ate the fruit in the garden. They had shame, and God says, clothe yourselves. God shows them the way back to being covered by his provision. And this is why he eventually sends Jesus to take on the sins of the world, to clothe and cover all of us in righteousness. Eve was just focused on the wrong father figure. I sense that We need to stop letting the world define Father for us. Stop letting our life experiences define the God of heaven. Because there's a news flash here. Your your, Your earthly dad has flaws. We all do. Your heavenly Father loves you despite your flaws. Your heavenly father loves your daddy too. Now we can turn to the word to see the Bible evidences that our heavenly father is consistent. Revelations 1 verse 8. His New Testament title he gives is Alpha and Omega. These are the letters of the Greek alphabet, symbolizing that Christ is before everything and will surpass all things. He declared his divine judgment to be eternal in Matthew 18, verse 8. John the Baptist, who preceded Jesus, is still recognized the etern- eternality, wow, that one's hard, eternality of Christ when he said, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me, because he is the eternal one. Now, there are things, when we're talking about consistency, that my earthly dad did that I could bet on would happen every time. If I bet a million dollars, I'd make a million dollars. If I came home and my car was dirty, he would wash it. If I talked back to my mom and he heard it, I would hear about it. If there was a storm, he would make sure that all the flashlights in the house had batteries. If I was sad, he would comfort me. If I was tired, he would tuck me in, making sure that, you know, like your pants get pulled down, right, so they're all bunched up and tuck you in from your feet all the way to your shoulders, like the good kind of tuck in. If I was sick, he would stop by the store and bring me home a stuffed animal. 
If it was Saturday morning, he would wake me up early before everybody else in the house, take me to the grocery store and buy donuts and sugar cereal that we weren't allowed to have and gummy bears and all the things that would fit into one grocery bag and cost way too much money. But that was Saturday morning. If I went to change the channel when he was sleeping, <laughs> and you get one click in, one eye would open. I'm watching that. Change it back. Every time. Even today, if you're guessing, it's probably going to happen on Christmas. OK, so all of, I say all of that to say this that I know that my earthly dad loves me. But there are so many things that I probably never saw my dad doing for me, and that's the same as our Heavenly Father. He is always working and is tireless at his pursuit to show us how much he loves us. Even if you've not seen your own dad, as a protector or a provider, you can trust that God, your everlasting Father, is. Mm -hmm. Because God protects you and trusts that what he has instilled in you will get you through your trials. Let me say that again. God protects you and trusts that what he has put in you will get you through your trials. So that little part in 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 6, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through it, is tested by fire. Now, Charles Spurgeon, he once wrote, trials teach us what we are. They dig up the soil, and they let us see what we're made of. Being on a spiritual path does not prevent you from facing darkness, but it does teach you how to use the darkness as a tool to grow. Trials help our perseverance. In James 1, verse 12, God says, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterwards, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. In Hebrews 10, verse 35, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You would need to persevere so that you have done the will of God. You will receive what he has promised. When it comes on focusing on God, our provider, there's some of us that might think of God like Santa. It's that time of year, right? Ask for what we want. Then we'll get it. But most of us know that God doesn't work that way. God supplies our need, not our greed. We need food, shelter, protection, jobs, money, rest, enjoyment, relationships, peace, freedom, significance, identity, knowledge, and I'm sure a whole laundry list of other things. Now, searching for these needs can be daunting at best. How do we fit all of that in? How do we find the time to meet our needs and then meet the needs of others that the Bible talks about? God boils it down. He says sometimes you make things too difficult. The answer's simple. Boil, boil your needs down to one. 
and seek that one need. God is our one need. Because when we have God in our lives, he'll take care of all of our needs because he is our provider. He is the source of life and he sustains it. Philippians 4.19, and my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory, Jesus Christ. Psalm 147, verse 8, who covers the heavens with clouds, who provides rain for the earth, and who makes grass grow on the mountains. Joey, you can come and join me. So who is your father figure? The father of eternity? Or are you, father, are you following other idols? Um, I know that God has given us four beautiful little girls for a reason because pretty much the last couple times that either he's preached or I've talked, we've all had an example of them. Um, I had a talk with one of the girls this week. Um, and we had a talk about negativity and how negativity affects our lives, our actions, our speech, our feelings, our emotions. We discussed the truths that, the truths that God speaks to us are not negative. He may point out something that needs to change but he's encouraging, gentle, and kind. When you hear, you shouldn't do that, you're not qualified. You were never trained to do that. Why would you think you can? Those are the voices of the enemy. Those are the voices that tell us we'll never measure up and that we're the worst person for it. Nobody really likes you, let alone loves you. Those are from the originator of lies. But when we hear, go for it. I'll help you. You may not have that degree, but let's figure it out together. I'll help you find the money. I'll encourage you. I'll be with you you know that those are the voices of your everlasting Father. Doing what He does best. Helping you be the best you that He has created. Now, when I was a teenager, I used to go, I wasn't even sneaking, I wasn't even sneaky about it, go into my dad's closet and find a comfortable sweater or sweatshirt to put on. Anybody else? I always went to his side of the closet because that's where the comfiest stuff was. <laughs> Scan the hangers, find the warm shirt, the fuzzy sweater. And I realize now that it was a sense of comfort I was searching for. Maybe not even just for my body, but for my soul. I just heard Beth say it, because it smelled like him. But now, because I don't live with my daddy, because I probably still would, <clears throat> I search in the scriptures to be comforted. I listen to the Holy Spirit for that comfort because I know that God is my everlasting Father who wants to be with me always. Now, author Philip Graham Riken wrote this. He wrote about God. God's name expresses his person. It reflects who he is. The name God himself as he has made himself known, it reveals his divine nature and his eternal qualities. God is who his name is. Thus, all the biblical names and titles for God reveal his true character. 
Most of them refer to the one of his actions or attributes. He is the Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. He is El Shaddai, the mighty God. He is the Holy One, the everlasting Father. He is the maker and the redeemer. He is the shepherd, the rock, and the hiding place. Whatever the name, God is his name. And it is because he does what his name says. And it has been said that the eternal, everlasting God has become our Father, and the moment we realize that, it transforms everything. You pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing to us these truths that you are who you say you are. That we can believe for those things that you have for us. We can put our hope, our faith, and our trust in you because you'll take care of us and our needs. We love you, Father. And in your precious name we pray, amen.